Although some areas of Idaho haven't seen the last of this winter snow, spring has arrived. Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. Tonight we begin our show by exploring the Thousand Springs Preserve along the Snake River near Hagerman, a unique area touched early by the gentle warmth of spring. There's no other place like it in Idaho or in the whole country. Water appears from nowhere, tumbling over rocks and through lush green foliage. It erupts well below the crest of the basalt cliffs that edge the historic boundary of the Snake River. Called the Thousand Springs Reach, it stretches 40 miles, draining an immense underground aquifer. Snows and rains that fall in the Sawtooth and the Teton Mountains feed the underground lake seeping below 10,000 square miles of Snake River Plain and appearing here almost 150 years later. Most of the springs have been diverted for aquaculture or hydropower, but one remains untapped, Minnie Miller Falls, named for the original owner of the farm below. We have people coming from all over saying, oh, my grandfather in such and such a state bought Minnie Miller cattle. She sold cattle worldwide. This was quite unusual back in the 1920s and 1930s. She was way ahead of her time. The farm buildings are beautifully preserved. Intricate woodwork forms the cathedral ceiling of an upper story hayloft. High up in the beams, a screech owl loafs, keeping a wary eye on the human visitors below. Cattle stalls display technology that was state of the art in the earlier part of this century. Although the buildings remain as a lasting legacy, the cattle are long gone. In 1986, a private nonprofit group called the Nature Conservancy purchased Minnie Miller's old Guernsey farm and turned it into a refuge for wildlife called the Thousand Springs Preserve. The goals of the Nature Conservancy right here at this preserve are to protect the springs, both the water quality and the water quantity, both are important, to develop good wildlife habitat on this land which has been farmed for many, many years and to keep it open to the, or to reopen it up to the public. The farm is actually an island. Sparkling spring water feeds a crystal clear stream that it winds along the eastern shoreline of the island. At its southern point, it meets the muddy waters of the Snake River. A distinct line forms, dramatically illustrating the point where pristine meets polluted. But over the last few years, farmers, communities, and local industries have joined together in an effort to clean up the degraded waters of the Snake River. Okay, put it in there, and we'll push some dirt around it. Okay, and then you want to stand up and use your toe and press. Yeah. Grace Kohler's fifth graders are doing their part. If you've got a hole, here's a barrel full of plants. The 25 kids from Wendell Elementary are planting marsh grasses in an eroded area above the spring. Why? Oh, because kids need to feel that they are part of helping the environment. They need to practice what it is we've uh, talked about in the classroom when we talk about the plants can help clean up the water. They need to see the wetland that's there and have their hands on the process. And then they have ownership in it, you know, they can come back in years later and say, I helped do that. I helped clean up the environment. Last one's one. When the water runs across the chair, it'll seep into the soil, and when it runs back out, it'll be cleaner. Well, you plant, you plant it all over, and then they keep growing and reproducing, and they spread out everywhere, and it gets really thick, so it catches all the mud. The kids are adding to a project instigated by the Northside Canal Company. They built a 30-acre wetland on Nature Conservancy property to filter the pollutants out of this irrigation water before it drops back into the Snake River. Can you imagine this dirty water dropping into that beautiful creek down below? That's what used to happen until the Canal Company said, you know, I bet we could clean that water up. The design has become a prototype for others interested in cleaning up the area's streams. So the dirt comes out in the first and the second stages. In the third stage, the water should be very clean looking, but it still has lots of nutrients. 
And then what happens after that? Who would like to read this? They're the ones who are going to make the differences. People our age are pretty set in our ways. And it's kids who can learn really how to be good caretakers of the land to keep it healthy for everybody. Oscar, good job. Move in. The kids aren't the only volunteers contributing their time. Okay. Yep. Bill, coming down. Pretty easy. Kevin Price is a biologist. Yep. When he's not working at the Hagerman State Fish Hatchery nearby, he's building and erecting goose nest boxes. He's made 65 of them over the last two years, and six of those are right here at Thousand Springs Preserve. That's pretty good right there. That nest is ready. She'll come in, pluck some breast feathers and down, make a bedding in the middle to keep her eggs. This goose seems very contented on her elevated platform. Soon, goslings will hatch, adding to the incredible variety of wildlife already drawn to the area. Bird watchers have recorded 158 species over the last five years. Porcupines, muskrats, foxes, deer, even a mountain lion has been sighted. Visitors are encouraged. Whether hiking or paddling, Nothing could be finer than a soft spring day touring the beauty of the Thousand Springs Preserve. And so here it is, engorged. This is an engorged. Dermacenter Andersoni, the Rocky Mountain wood tick. Spring is a great time of the year for those of us who love the outdoors, but it also means tick season. In our next story, we'll actually go hunting for the little pests. Just how dangerous are they, and where do we find them? Particularly in the spring, particularly on days of good, high relative humidity. Shortly after rain, when there's a lot of ground moisture, the air is humid, so the ticks do not dry out. That's when they're more likely to quest, when they come up on the vegetation and sit there with their anterior appendages, you know, waving in the breeze, so to speak, awaiting somebody to come. Dr. Uh, Charles well, Baker specializes in entomology, the, the study of insects. He's allowed this tick to crawl here, across his shirt to demonstrate the advantage of wearing pale or pastel-colored clothing in the field. Two. As you can see, the dark body of the tick is easily visible. Well, he also suggests pants that match the environment, forest green or khaki. And if you're in a heavy tick area, tuck your pants into your boots and spray some insect repellent on your clothing. Now, most of us are perfectly happy to go hiking and never encounter one of those nasty little ticks. But not so Dr. Baker. In fact, he's out here today actually trying to hunt down one or two tiny so pests to take back to the like... laboratory. <clears throat> what I'm doing is flagging, basically. It's using a muslin sheet. White muslin is something that a tick can grab a hold of easily. Although ticks have poor eyesight, they're attracted to change in light intensity when something white crosses their field of vision. The white underbellies of deer and elk are natural targets for a questing tick. If you watch deer that are undisturbed, they'll spend a lot of time in one very limited area moving slowly so the tick doesn't have to just literally grab a passing host. They've got time, they're patient too, and they get aboard. And then they move. They just keep moving up the limbs onto the trunk, and they keep going towards the head and back as their favorite areas where the animal's less likely to dislodge them, especially up around the ears. That's one of their favorite places. That's where I routinely check my dog. So how do you remove a tick if you find one? Well, most of us would do exactly what this woman is doing. Uncover the tick, and in this case, it's burrowed into the coat of her dog, grab it with our fingers, and pull it off. But that's wrong. Never, never, never grab a tick, 
barehandedly pull it off and then squeeze it between your fingers. That is an absolute no-no. Imagine Dr. Baker's hand as the surface of your skin. The syringe is a tick that burrowed beneath. And this is the tick filled with blood that it has taken from us and mixed with its body uh, secretions in its gut. If you grab that tick to remove it, this is like a syringe, and you're going to put pressure on that tick and force fluids down the pike into your body like that. Hot matches, Vaseline, kerosene, the various methods we've all heard about will have the same effect, forcing the tick to deflate its mouth parts, consequently injecting the fluid into your system. So what you want to do is take a pair of forceps. Now I've used big forceps here to go along with our simulated tick. And you slide those forceps right along your skin or the skin of your dog, clamp right there on those mouth parts. You may get a little fluid, but you're minimizing the amount of fluid going in. You've clamped down, and now you push against the tick and push it off. And that is the correct procedure. If you don't have a forceps handy, Dr. Baker suggests using two coins to avoid touching the tick. Afterwards, apply a topical sterilizing solution like betadine. A Rocky Mountain wood tick, the type you're seeing here, can pass on a rare disease called Rocky Mountain spotted fever. It's estimated that only one in a hundred thousand ticks carry the disease, but, but if you find yourself feeling poorly after a tick bite, you should go to a physician, because if untreated, the disease can be fatal. Lyme disease, fortunately for us here in Idaho, is a rare, very rare event. Uh, at this time, there's probably only one or two cases, if that, contracted in Idaho in a given year. Our state has very few of the smaller ticks that carry Lyme disease, but even in Idaho, you can contract a condition called tick paralysis from a bite. So be sure to check your children for ticks if you spent time in the outdoors. Now, if you look closely, you can see that a tick has eight legs like a spider. This means they are a member of the arachnid family. The female Rocky Mountain wood tick has a dark body and a small white protective plate called a scutum. She's in a defensive mode here. She's pulled in her legs and is feigning death. And if she thinks everything's okay, she'll then begin to move again. And there she goes, trundling off in search of whatever she wants. She's probably looking for a large host animal, like a deer or elk, to take a full blood meal, enough to nourish three to 7,000 eggs. If she's successful, she'll look like this when she drops off. And so here it is, engorged. This is an engorged. Dermacenter andersoni, the Rocky Mountain wood tick. And uh, in a matter of a week or two, she'll begin to produce eggs. And we'll do that over a span of several weeks, a couple months maybe at most. In her distended state, it's difficult for her to right herself. But when she's placed on her belly, she somehow slowly pulls herself along the lip of the microscope. The eggs look like this. You can see among the eggs some seed ticks or larvae that have already developed their first set of six legs. So little ticks tend to prefer mice and other small mammals like ground squirrels, and they take their blood meal, and then they drop off, and then they molt their skeleton, and now they have eight legs. Ticks go through another nymph stage where they seek larger hosts like rabbits and badgers before completing the two-year cycle and becoming a full adult. So ticks tend to be concentrated in areas where you'll find all three kinds of host animals. Usually, the mixed brush and grasses of deer and elk winter range where small animals like ground squirrels are also present. Okay, here's our male tick with a hard plate over his whole body. The back end is not dark and soft like in the female. The male tick will never become distended like the female because he won't be bearing eggs but his bite can be just as dangerous. So next time you head out on a hike, remember, wear your khakis, use your bug Come. spray, and pack Come along on. your forceps. Come on, girl. Careful of the fence. You're savvy. Heel. Raise your hand if you've seen a frog. Everybody has seen a frog? It's a good thing I didn't bring one then. I have seen a tadpole. Have you seen tadpoles? It seems wildlife and kids are a natural combination. From stuffed animals and picture books to zoos and movies, most children express an intense interest in the wildlife that chairs our earth. In our next story, 
Meet the members of a special club formed in Boise, made up of four to eight year olds who just can't seem to get enough of wildlife. They meet each month at the Morrison Knudsen Nature Center. Kids wide awake and full of energy are followed by moms and dads still toting their morning coffee. It's the second Saturday of the month and that means it's time for Critter okay. Club. What's our topic for today? Frogs. Frogs. How did you know that? Because I sent you a note. I sent you a note. <laughs> did you get it in the mail? Each child pays an annual membership fee of $15. In return, he or she receives a monthly newsletter addressed directly to the child outlining the month's topic. Art supplies and other materials are provided for the meetings and once a year, usually in the summer, a special field trip is scheduled. Okay, what do we know about frogs? What do you know? They're amphibians. They're amphibians. What does that mean? They live on water and on land. That's right. The word amphibian means two lives. That means they spend part of their life in the water and part of their life on land. Critter Club is sort of a spin-off from a nature center program for adults called Wildlife Wednesdays. Kathy Zager convinced the staff to launch a similar program designed for kids. Her idea became Critter Club and its popularity has grown way beyond even Kathy's original expectations. Was there any other clue? No, we get 10 or 15. And uh, the first year we had 52. Uh, last year we had 70 and now in its third year we have 98. Who would eat a frog? Greta? A great blue heron would eat a frog. Yeah. Yeah? A praying mantis to eat a frog. I think a praying mantis, a frog might eat a praying mantis. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. A frog, yeah, a frog would eat a praying mantis. Nevin? Kathy plays on their natural curiosity, providing an interactive atmosphere that makes learning easy and encourages the kids to think about the world around them. Let's see what else we know about frogs. Most frogs have something in common. They have bulging eyes. When we talked about the owls, what direction could the owls see? Remember? Just straight, ahead. Just straight ahead. What direction do you think frogs can see? They have to see all around. Why is that important that they can see all around? So they don't get eaten. So they don't get eaten. That's right. That's exactly why. The kids learn about the life cycle of the frog from tadpole to adult and how it uses oxygen and the various stages of its development. Then it's time to listen to frogs talk. Wood frog. We have wood Ram frogs. <laughs> they sound like ducks. They do sound like ducks, don't they? <laughs> Finally, the kids get a chance to show what they've learned. Are, are you ready to make something? Yeah! yeah. yeah. Said they needed scissors. There's them. The kids crowd eagerly to the front of the room, gathering scissors, crayons, and paper plates. Each child gets to cut and color his or her own version of the life cycle of the frog. And Kathy Zager hopes that along with this art project, they'll take home something more. Uh, an awareness and appreciation for wildlife, um, how we're connected, um, understanding the world around us. Can you tell me what you know about frogs? Um, I know that they hibernate. Oh yeah, what's that mean? What's that word mean? It means that they sleep through the whole winter. Critter Club is not just about learning, it's also about the innate human desire to be part of a group, to socialize and interact. We like it. Um, it's something where he feels like he belongs. We come every month, they send him a letter, so he looks forward to it all month long. What's your favorite frog? Um, the poison arrow. Why's that? Because it, it has different colors. What kind of colors? Black, yellow, all kinds. Poison arrow frogs, hibernation, amphibians, big words coming from little kids. It's amazing what they've learned 
but it comes as no surprise to their leader, Kathy Zager. You just start talking to them. Um, each week we learn, or each month we learn one or two more things, and they remember wildlife is a natural turn on for kids. It's a natural way to, they're excited, they want to know. Most frogs begin life in water with tiny eggs. Can you see those black dots? Those are the frogs. Those black dots are the eggs. We'll close our show tonight by going back to the Thousand Springs Preserve where Kevin Price is erecting a nesting box for tonight's creature feature, the Canada Goose. These uh, nest platforms, when they're used, provide the birds with a good degree of protection from flood water, high water. Uh, you'll be able to see how it's going to be very difficult for a nest predator to get at the nest and destroy the eggs. Once the eggs hatch and the goslings are able to move about in a very short time, uh, they'll leave the nest. The adults don't bring food to their young. Waterfowl don't do that. The, the offspring have to get out of the nest and start foraging on their own. The young birds, while they're growing, eat a lot of insects and invertebrates. So this rich streamside habitat here with the pasture along the edge will we'll give them a lot of bugs to chase and eat. 